you know, um, I represent a company that's based in Switzerland. I live in New York and I've met people from all over the world here. You know, 2020 has been a rough year, but, you know, for our industry to have gotten through this and come out the other end even stronger says a lot about the resiliency of the industry. Uh, another thing I'd like to thank the organizers for is really introducing us to how progressive and forward thinking the UAE government is about emerging technologies, including AI, 5G, and particularly blockchain. You know, it's very rare that you spend two days in a country and immediately decide that we're going to have to set up an office in this country. As of yesterday, we made that decision because we think the things that we can achieve uh, with the institutions here in the UAE could be game changing and really act as a roadmap for what we want to do as a company. Now, before I talk uh, about Casper and what we're doing, let me just set the stage of what we're going to cover. To give some background, you know, I began programming when I was 11, uh, been obsessed with distributed computing since 2002. That's when uh, I started uh, coding on the BitTorrent protocol. Um, started buying Bitcoin in 2012 and kind of became an angel investor in the space. I was fortunate, you know, during my career at Bain Capital and hedge funds to have really invested in, seen and driven, you know, technology shifts in cloud, um, in middleware, in VoIP and many technologies. And as a result, have seen the things that have stopped, you know, enterprise adoption of technology and how those problems were eventually solved. Which brings me, you, all right, Cliff is reminding me that I'm not loud enough, which is usually not the problem, but I'll be, I'll try and speak uh, more clearly. Um, so the topic today is really going to be about enterprise adoption of blockchain technology. So before we get into the trilemma, let's talk about where we are as an industry. Enterprise adoption, in my opinion, of blockchain technology is close to zero. Many people will disagree with this, but if you look at this statistically, there's about 10,000 blockchain developers in the world. There's about 30 million developers working on enterprise-grade technology today. And other than small proof of concepts, real underlying usage of this technology to drive enterprise problems, solve cost issues, and increase trust has been limited. And this comes down to many reasons, and we'll go over some of them. But the first one really is that the blockchain trilemma hasn't really been solved. Everyone's tried to figure out how do we make these blockchains more scalable and faster. And the way they've done that is by sacrificing decentralization or safety, most of the time both. And I'm not gonna give a laundry list of protocols and how exactly they sacrifice it, but trust me, each and every single one sacrifices these. But if you think about the implication if someone told you that there's an extremely fast plane, but you know, there's a 10% higher chance that it's gonna crash, you're never going to fly on that plane. Similarly, if someone says, I have this amazing you know, database technology where no one can ever change the values, but you know, it's not decentralized enough. And if these six guys come together, they can reverse things. You wouldn't use that either. This is the reason why block, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum are still the most widely used technologies in the space. And that's because there's been no compromise to decentralization or security. And when we, we were building the Casper network, we're like, okay, what, what is our inviolate rule? And our inviolate rule was, if you're not fully decentralized and you don't have the same level of security as a proof of work chain, even being proof of stake, no one will use it because they shouldn't. It's just an expensive technology that isn't meeting their needs. Now, we've been fortunate to solve this problem because of an excellent researcher named Dr. Daniel Kane. He's a double PhD from MIT and Harvard. We were really, really fortunate to meet him in early 2019. He's the primary author of our consensus protocol who figured out a way to solve this trilemma. Uh, the full mathematical paper is actually up on our website and it got recently uh, reviewed by Trail of Bits. If you really want to geek out, uh, I'd highly suggest reading it. Uh, it's a tough read though, I will, I will start with that. And then let's talk about the problems with uh, first generation blockchains, right? So you have the non, um, 
the non-VM-based blockchains, and then you have the VM-based blockchains. But really, they don't solve the issues of usability, stability, value, and trust. And this really comes down to four core problems. And let me talk about each of them briefly. One big problem is that a lot of blockchains require you to learn a proprietary programming language. That's Solidity for Ethereum, Plutus for Cardano, Mickelson for Tezos. Um, and the question is, why, why does this happen? Well, the reason why it happens is it's easy. If you're building you know, uh, a VM from scratch, it's much easier to just create a proprietary programming language. But think about the most widely used technologies out there. Every database uses SQL, irrespective of whether it's Oracle, Microsoft, you know, Mongo, Couch. All of them use SQL, and so there's a lingua franca across the industry. Think about AWS and any software deployment out there. They use JavaScript, Rust, Assembly Script. There, there is a set of languages, there's a set of IDEs, and there's a set of enterprise grade language support out there. And blockchain should not be ignoring this. And so, you know, as a system, we, we started right out the gate saying, we need to build a system that isn't friendly for blockchain developers. There's only 10,000 of those. It should be friendly for developers, period, because there's 30 million of them. The second big issue is lack of pricing predictability. If you think about any enterprise business, you know, they, they do things called budgets. They need to figure out what their underlying cost for computation is eventually going to be. Now, if you're gas price to do a, con to do a contract on Ethereum or any blockchain, moves rapidly and actually sometimes gives you diseconomies of scale because as the network's bigger and more powerful, you're actually paying more. Think about any other economy. When, when stuff gets bigger, you actually get cost benefits to the end user. This is really antithetical to every single technology uh, that we've seen out there. And so finding a way to make sure that gas prices are stable and fiat paired is extremely important. And then upgrade plan, paths are really, really unclear. Um, you know, every single one of you has a smartphone here. Uh, and every single one of you has probably seen an upgrade in the last two to three days. Think about the upgrade cycle for blockchains today. It takes forever. It's extremely complicated, requires a hard fork, and lots of the time makes a lot of the previous contracts um, obsolete. And the reason why it's so tough is just because the systems to enable upgradability haven't been created. You know, Windows spends a lot of time to make sure that the Windows upgrade path is easy. Linux spends a lot of time doing the same thing. iOS does the same thing on your iPhone. And blockchain technology needs to look exactly like that. And then finally, you know, it's usability and a lack of general features that enterprises need. And you know, I could go through a laundry list of things, but let me give you one very specific example. Every blockchain today, if you want to pay for computation, you want to send data anywhere, the sender always pays for the transaction fee in every single case. But think about cases where that actually doesn't make sense. Say you're creating a credentialing system on the blockchain and you want Harvard University to certify that so-and-so went to Harvard mm -hmm. University. You're actually asking Harvard University to pay to help you certify the person. Now, if you could create a smart contract system where the receiver of the information pays for the underlying uh, transaction fee, or in fact, additionally pays to have that certification come in, you've now created a really, really evocative set of pricing mechanisms. And we think this is extremely important. And why, why is it sender only pays today in the industry? Because I think the industry in general is always trying to do what it's always been doing, as opposed to thinking about what do enterprises actually need and how do we build a blockchain in a way that enterprises can actually use it. You know, the tipping point's gonna come really when enterprises, you know, see that a blockchain has solved these four major issues. You know, PwC has said about 84% of CIOs and CTOs are seriously considering this technology, but they haven't really, you know, gone after it. And then Gartner, uh, you know, publishes reviews of blockchains that are enterprise grade, but unfortunately, the only ones they publish right now are private installations, which don't get you any of the trust 
that you get from a public blockchain. And this is actually an issue because you might as well use a database if you're just running the blockchain yourself because there's really no trustlessness at that point. So let's think about first generation blockchains versus what we're trying to do, which is to really enhance uh, enterprise grade adoption. Now we've gone through you know, how we scale without sacrifice, how it's easy to use and how we have predictable costs. But let's talk about future proofing. You know, I, I talked a little bit about upgrades, but this is, this is actually extremely important. No matter what we build today, better technology is gonna come out in the future. Someone's gonna figure out better research. Uh, but think about Linux and Microsoft. There's a lot of um, you know, innovation that comes out in the operating system world, but their ability to ensure that those innovations and that research coming out of university becomes part of the stack is what's enabled them to you know, create systems that have been upgraded for the past many decades. And this is only possible if, if you've thought about that problem up front and made sure that your underlying blockchain allows this. We allow on, in contract, on chain upgrades to the system. And you know, this is not forced by any centralized authority. It's just a standard package that goes to all the validators. Validators vote on it. And if people want to take the upgrade, they take it. Uh, most of the time, I think if it's a performance upgrade, it'll be pretty controversial. If it changes mining fees, you know, there might be a bit of a tate, a tate and some stuff might have to be dealt with off chain. And you know, it's not, there's no absolutely simple answer here, but this is absolutely crucial for enterprise adoption because enterprises don't want to go with a technology that could be obsolete in a decade with no ability to upgrade it. So I'm not going to go over this chart, but, you know, happy to share this presentation with everyone. But, you know, we have, you know, we spent most of our time talking to enterprises and figuring out exactly what they need to start building on blockchain. And, you know, just made a high level comparison. I won't go, you know, I, I won't go line by line because, you know, that wouldn't be particularly interesting. Um, but if I were to like summarize a few things about us. One is we're really guided by open source principles. So even though I've said a lot of things here that we're doing very differently from the industry, if these innovations are taken by the industry in general, nothing would make us happier. Our code is 100% open source. And if this is what drives blockchains to adopt all these features, that's great for all of us. As open source advocates, we believe a rising tide lifts all ships. And if, you know, We'd love to build the best blockchain out there. I think we are. But if the end result is we're a great blockchain out there, but we've helped spur, spur innovation and get everyone to create enterprise-grade products, I think we would have done our job. Another thing that we do that is a bit different is we're not really a blockchain company per se. We've organized ourselves as a professional software company, meaning if someone does want to build something on the Casper network, there's a phone number you can call and a set of developers that will help you build your enterprise grade application. Um, so, you know, myself and my co-founders, uh, you know, have been working on this for about two and a half years. Uh, you can see some of their names here. I think we mentioned Dr. Kane. Uh, Meta is our CTO who spent a lot of time at multi-billion dollar companies like Adobe and Omniture building enterprise grade software. Cliff Sarkin, our chief operating so officer is there in the back. Uh, along with uh, Neil, who heads business development, and Scott Walker, who I actually co-founded the business with, Dr. Kane, who I talked about, um, and then Andreas, a uh, really interesting guy, uh, researcher from Google, who actually worked with Dr. Kane and built uh, most of our uh, schematics. That being said, this is just a sampling of the team. We have 45 full-time employees all over the world. They live in 11 countries and speak 19 different languages, which uh, surprises me every day. As you can imagine, we use Zoom a lot. So our Zoom bills are pretty, pretty high. Uh, also, we have a ton of advisors. Our advisory program has about 60 people in it. Uh, these are just some of the names, but you know, we have people from Dropbox, Facebook, and these are all the kind of enterprises we're talking with today to try and solve some of their biggest problems. So, you know, just, just in the interest of time, um, let me talk about one specific enterprise grade, uh, um, enterprise grade partnership we're doing right now. So IPWE manages patents 
uh, for Fortune 100 companies. Uh, they have a patent portfolio in the thousands. They're the largest patent management database in the world. Uh, they currently use Hyperledger for, uh, uh, for their blockchain initiatives. They, they evaluated every single layer one in the space. We've already built basically uh, the proof of concept and we'll have this at launch when we go live. But basically we'll have a complete chain of custody solution across 200 patent agencies and thousands of companies that manage their patents. And so the way licenses work, who owns that license, expiry on licenses can all be surfaced very, very transparently. And therefore, you know, people's inability to realize whether they're infringing patents or not has been greatly diminished because of this empowering technology. If you think about it, if there wasn't a public blockchain that enabled this, this kind of data would never be surfaced. There's a few other examples. Again, we're glad to share this deck with anyone. Um, but given we have limited time, I will talk about a brief history uh, of the company. So, you know, we, we launched in late 2018. We've had three fundraisers. We raised a 14 and a half Series A. We raised a $14 million private validator sale. We raised a second validator sale of eight. Actually, this is outdated. It's 12 at this point. Um, a lot of stuff happened over the past few days. So about $40 million in funding to date. Uh, we launch um, in, on March 15th, so really, really excited. We're about a month away from launch. Uh, could be plus or minus a week, just to be honest. You know, it's software. But we are doing our main sale on CoinList, which is a platform all of you, uh, all of you know. But if there's any uh, interest on what that looks like and if anyone wants to be a validator and or wants to be an enterprise partner with us, which is the most important thing to us and want us to help them build something out using a leading blockchain, we'd love to speak with you. So to learn more about us, uh, you know, uh, you can find us on Telegram at t.me slash Casper Labs or email us at hello at casperlabs.io. Um, we have a pretty large mailing list of, you know, I think it's about 18,000 people right now, but we'd love to have as many people join as possible. We, we do not spam you. We send a detailed technical update every month. You will not receive any spam from us. But uh, to conclude, you know, we're really excited um, to bring open source software to the industry and launch a network that is already spurring, but hopefully continues to spur widespread enterprise adoption. I think as an industry, we are ignoring what's the biggest opportunity. I think, you know, DeFi is kind of interesting, DEXs are kind of interesting, but the moment enterprises start solving real world problems with blockchain, I think that's when this industry goes parabolic. And, you know, we strongly hope that our research and our network uh, is going to be a major driver for that. Thank you all for your time. And if you have any questions for me or the rest of our team, we're there in the back. We'd be happy to answer um, any of them and spend time with you at the conference. Have a great rest of the day and thanks to the organizers again. Okay, great. Thank you, Minal. Our um, next uh, presentation is uh, by 2Prime. 2Prime, uh, uh, the title of the presentation is